Um, and given that, um, do you want to see if Perry wants to verbalize this question? Sorry, yeah, let me see. So, um, Perry, just type in if you'd like to verbalize your question so I can see that you're here. Okay, let's do it for the next one then. Oh, yeah, Perry, do you want to come up? Great, okay, let's hear you. Hi everyone. So I just uh, wonder uh, how, how can you uh, recruit someone new uh, without even meeting face to face even once? So currently we decided in, in our uh, company uh, to do the full uh, recruitment cycle uh, remotely, uh, but then uh, uh, stop it and decide if we can really close it this way or uh, we have to, for at least one time, uh, meet the guy face to face. So I wonder how it works for a Geek Club. Yeah, thank you, Perry. Thank you for that question. So I've answered with a couple of links here, which I think will be useful. It's an overview of how we do hiring, what our recruiting process framework looks like, as well as our interviewing process. So the long and short of it is we don't ever meet any of our new hires in person. We do the entire recruiting, sourcing, interviewing, and actually closing the offer and onboarding all remotely. We do get together in person though. We are very intentional about in-person interactions and we have a guide on that as well. In fact, I'll link that just so you have some perspective. A lot of people wonder, you know, if you're an all remote company, do you ever get together in person? And the answer is yes. We get the entire company together once a year for a big company summit. Almost no work, just there for relational bonding. We also have in-person events called GitLab Commit. We have about four or five of those a year where we get subsections of the team, if they're relatively local, and we get people together. So we give people as many opportunities to be together as possible. But we don't see in-person as something that's mandatory before you hire someone. And especially if there's, there's periods where GitLab is bringing on 10, 20, 30, 40 new people a week, it becomes unscalable to just try to fly someone out. It's a ton of time spent to just get an hour in person. And that's a more philosophically, we actually love this approach because it makes us less biased as a company. Because in a lot of cases, the reason you feel like you want to meet someone in person before hiring them is because people generally buy with emotion and then justify with logic. And in, in a lot of cases, when it comes to hiring, you simply want to sit across from someone so that your emotions can be okay with the purchase you're about to make. And by removing that, it makes you focus on the actual person, the actual results, and, and what they bring to the company, their intelligence and their effort and their determination that they bring to the company. It doesn't have anything to do with how they look or their, how they carry themselves in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So we actually think that it removes a lot of that bias. Now, in turn, our interview processes are very thorough. Some may say they're even a little bit long and lengthy. Um, but we do that because we, we don't have the in-person element and we want to make sure just as much as we want to be sure in the person, we want to make sure the person is sure about GitLab. And I think that slight twist in how you're thinking about it, you need to come at it from the approach of well, let's make sure that this company is okay with what we offer, that they're cool with the remote setup, that they're cool with the remote infrastructure. Do they have any additional questions about how we communicate? You want to make sure that they're okay with it, that they're going to acclimate well, that you're going to be able to provide them with what they need. So that's, that's a bit of a long answer, but hopefully it gives some context on how we see it. Sure, thank you. Question five, do we wanna offer the opportunity to verbalize that one? Hi. Um, just wanted to ask about common issues for remote workers. So we have a couple of remote workers and basically all the company went remote, right? But I want to know if there are any issues or common issues that we can solve or know ahead of time and tackle them ahead of time to help our remote workers to go through that period of time or issues during that remote work. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Excellent question. So I've linked a page that we've compiled on remote drawbacks. There are a lot of remote drawbacks, just like there's a lot of drawbacks to commuting to an office every day. So it's being aware of those and trying to proactively address those is, uh, is recommended. Now here's the, here's the wrinkle in this. So at GitLab, we were intentionally remote from the very beginning. And so people opt into working here. Therefore, common things like isolation or we don't get to see people at the office enough aren't really drawbacks for our workers because they knew what they were getting into from the start. But what you have happening in mass right now are people that actually would prefer to be in an office. They like the elements of their in-office role and now suddenly they cannot do that. So they're at a significant disadvantage and you have to work a lot harder to help them acclimate to something that they would not opt into otherwise. The most common one I've seen is kind of a sudden and jarring disconnect from the flow of how they interface and interact with people in their company. And it's really important to do two things. One is to provide a feedback mechanism. Leaderships now more than ever need to embrace the mindset of kind of servant leadership, essentially asking perpetually, what can I do for you? What isn't working well for you? What do you miss about how we were working a month ago and then let them tell you exactly what it is so that hopefully you can get something prescriptive out of that to turn into a solution. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is proactively providing an atmosphere and a place for people to talk about something other than work. Because at an office, people generally will just figure out ways to meet maybe over at uh, the kitchen or they'll go grab coffee together or they'll go have dinner they'll do something that's not work related and they won't even really recognize that it's happening. It's not something that, that they necessarily think about intentionally. It's just something that they, they do. It's just the human nature to connect on a more significant level than just work. So the problem is if you just transition to remote and you've used Slack or email, for example, only for work, well now this person feels like I don't have a way to connect with my colleagues on anything but a work level. And this may be passable for a few weeks, but eventually it will start to erode the culture and you'll start to see early traces of burnout. So for us, what we do is create topical channels in Slack and we actually encourage people to just have these conversations about real life. The other thing you could do is have a perpetual Zoom room. I've seen people call it the hotel lobby or the office lobby. And it's exactly that. People can just be very transient. They can come in, they can sort of share a coffee together, like their kids are running around in the background, they got pets, it doesn't really matter. It's just the coffee lobby. Same thing for lunch, kind of water cooler chat. I just encourage people to keep talking about what you normally would talk about, but the medium will change. Instead of being able to physically talk about it in an office, create a virtual space that that can happen as well. And that helps people acclimate. And again, this is a process of iteration. Open your ears to feedback and you'll get better and better and better at this. GitLab, we're nine or 10 years into this and we're still finding new ways to connect people. It's, it's not something that's ever done. Just the, the other week, we, um, we sort of stumbled upon this idea of a juice box chat. So we have coffee chats for adults where we can just grab some coffee, talk about anything. But then parents have all uh, kids at home now. And we're, we thought, hey, maybe it would be interesting to just get 30 parents to turn their Zoom chats on and just get all their kids together, and share music and share toys and speak different languages to each other. Like just let them engage and give the parents a break and let the kids get some cultural exploration. And so now we set up a Google sheet where people can grab times with other parents. And that has actually been a really amazing thing to spin up out of this. So the world sees us all as very isolated, but actually our kids are connecting with kids in a way that they never have been able to. So it just takes a little bit of proactivity and thinking, well, we've got the whole world at our disposal and, and webcams, what, what can we do with that? But you, you have to have leadership be intentional about that. Otherwise people get too caught up in work and they don't stop to think about it. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question um, is going to be uh, Ron, Ron Geller. There we go. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. I hear you. I, I would like to get any tricks to help with establishing trust in a remote environment. How do you build trust between colleagues? Um, things that can help communicate better. 
Sure. So uh, I, I noticed here it's uh, part of your question was about trust, and then also there was. Um, oh, sorry, we're on run. Not Roy. My apologies. Yes, tricks and, tricks to establish trust in a remote environment. So I've linked a guide here to building culture, uh, of which trust is a significant part. The long and short of this is you got to lead with empathy and trust by default and provide a mechanism for feedback. And this could feel really unusual for a lot of companies that have traditionally worked in more of a command and control type of environment, where it's gonna feel unusual for leaders to just suddenly revert on everything that's got them thus far and essentially say, hey, I'm just all ears. I know this is gonna be strange for you. You're in a new work environment. What can we do to, to make it better? So if leadership leads with trust and they essentially admit that their employees are now in a strange environment and they're here to help. You, what I've seen is you typically get that trust in return where the employee says, okay, leadership understands that this is weird. They're open ears. They're willing to make some changes and do some things to set us up for success. Uh, now, now we're more on the same page. The second thing is, honestly, the, the world is in a weird place right now and it would be a little bit disingenuous to assume that productivity and metrics are going to be able to remain the same. And so I've seen a lot of success come from leaders proactively taking the steps of reducing KPIs, reducing metrics, and essentially saying, look, friends and family first right now, we cannot possibly hold you to the same metrics that we were leading into 2020 because your work environment changed. You might have kids home from school. Maybe you're double dutying as an educator right now. These are, this is just the reality of, of our world. And if you take those steps, what I've seen is that people respond by being loyal. They respond by giving whatever they can. They respond by maybe even working odd hours to try to compensate for, for you being trusting of letting them uh, take off earlier to be with their kids, something like that. That is very much blanket advice. I can't guarantee that it's going to work for every company and in every installation, but I have seen quite a few examples of this done wrong, where the first step leaders take is to lay out this long additional new list of rules and micromanagement is their first thought. I would not recommend that. Um, that, that people are already going to feel like I, I'm destabilized. The last thing I need is more looking over my shoulder. And there's a difference between micromanagement and setting up structure around communications. Clarity is very much appreciated. Micromanagement, not so much. So hopefully that combined with that link will give you um, something to go on. Thanks. Okay, uh, we're moving on to Rui. Hold on just a second. Yes, there we are. Okay. Rui. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks. Um, second, two questions. One about, uh, let me open my, um, one about potential burnout, especially these days. You kind of alluded to that in, in your previous answer. So people are home, some are parents, and they have to deal with both with kids and with work. Some, on the other hand, are you know, single people and they have nothing to do, so they work 16 hours a day. So for any thoughts about how can people, how to, to prevent this kind of burnout, especially during these days, these times? Yeah, phenomenal question. So I've linked a guide there that we stood up on mental health and I, I hope that will be useful. Feel free to share that. Um, one of the elements in there talks about realistic expectations. And so from the work perspective, leaders can do their part by, um, having honest conversations with their employees. And if you now have an employee that suddenly has two kids at home that they essentially have to be an educator, there should be an honest conversation on, look, we're not gonna expect as much from you. What, what do you think this can look like? And let's iterate on that. If you try to hold them to the same level of expectation before all of this, it's a guaranteed road to burnout. There's just absolutely no avoiding it. Now on the isolation side, I talked a little bit about this, but you really have to be proactive in setting up an atmosphere for people to communicate and connect. Another example that I'll bring up from last week, so our people group work with our marketing leadership to basically ask that question. Is there something that we could put on the calendar that would bring people together and lift their spirits? And so we thought, let's do a talent show, a full on talent show with judges, prizes, everything. So we had, we set this up two weeks in advance with an agenda doc. 
uh, and we invited the entire marketing team. So we have 135 people are invited to this. And the instructions were very easy. Here's the invite, here's the Google Doc. You're welcome to sign up and bring your talent if you wanna compete. So I think we had 29 or so people sign up with different talents. We had one person kind of bring their chihuahua on and they could do sign language and then the chihuahua would do something. Uh, we had one gentleman that actually zoomed into the, his kitchen and like was like flames were flying up, like it was very Gordon Ramsay-esque, he was cooking something incredibly quickly. Uh, we, but it was a full-on, full-scale talent show. Some of the craziest things I've ever seen because we were able to engage and interact with people in their homes without the burden of the office. And again, at the end of it, we had a full panel, we had judges, like we're mailing out prizes to people, uh, and we're gonna start doing this on a more regular basis. Another example of this is a very simple show and tell. Invite your team to just jump on a Zoom, maybe the end of the week, everybody bring your uh, beverage or, or food of choice, and uh, essentially you just show off something you're proud of, something that you've built, something that you've written, music that you've created, something that your children or family have created, and you just talk about it, explain why it's important to you, where it came from. It, it enables you to connect with people on a very deep level. These things are not difficult. It was not difficult to add that meeting to our marketing team. It just took the effort of thinking through what ways can we get people together to talk about something other than work. Uh, so those are two examples. Uh, let me know if you do a, a talent show. We had a lot of fun with that. Yeah, my, thanks. My other question was about, you mentioned a single onboarding guide. Uh, what do you do about different teams that require, you know, probably marketing team requires different onboarding than someone in the engineering or DevOps team? So how do you maintain that kind of depth while having multiple teams with multiple requirements? It's a great question. So I'm gonna link this here. This is our onboarding template. I should say templates. Uh, and if you click on that, essentially you'll see all of our GitLab issues. There's one at the top for all GitLab team members. So there's some baseline things that everyone has to go through. And then there's, it's broken down by department. So there's specific onboarding elements that are only for people managers. And then there's specific elements only for engineering, for production, for design, for finance, so on and so forth. So the way we look at it is we have templates built up that you can stack together in a GitLab issue, depending on what the person's role is. Uh, so GitLab is great for this. I'm sure there are, there are other products where you can stack templates, but for us, it falls back on the people group to create these templates, work with leadership in those individual departments, uh, and let the department leads tell our people group, these are the things that we need people to go through in their onboarding. And then the people group builds that template based on that. And we, it's, it's very modular where it's plug and play. Everyone gets this, but then depending on your role, you get this. Uh, and so structuring that in a way that makes sense and again is transparent is how we do it. Thank you. Great. Um, we'll hear uh, a nuts question now. Hold on just a second. Yes. Well, and then we'll go back to the other questions. I'm waiting for answers still. Sounds good. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, so actually, my, my, my question is how you drive uh, deep changes into the company when everybody are remote, like uh, significant restructure, uh, you know, things that no, it normally takes time and a lot of work with the uh, with the employees. Uh. Yeah, so great question. I've linked a guide here on how we do this in building culture, but I will say this is much more difficult if you weren't already running your company in a remote setting. And what I mean by that is if people are very used to having change delivered to them in one way, and now you have to do it in a fundamentally different way, it is that by itself is going to just be disjointed and jarring. Again, to, to the opposite of this, if you forced all GitLab employees into an office and then announced some change, it would be very disorienting for us. On a base level though, I would say you need to lean into transparency in a way that you may not normally. Um, the, the best way to drive change, here's how we do it at GitLab. Any change needs to be first disseminated in a handbook, which is a universally accessible single source of truth. And then after the change is made in the handbook, we then disseminate it out, like we'll send a company-wide email or we'll send a Slack uh, in the respective channel linking to the handbook page. 
so that there's no ambiguity. Everyone gets the link, which lays out the change, and then there can be discussion about it. And we actually try to push the discussion further up. So a good example right now is we're looking into our expense system, how we do reimbursements. And we're trying to figure out if the current system we have is going to scale or if we need to switch to something else. So there's an open GitLab issue connected to a merge request. So we know that at some point, the handbook page on expensing is going to change. So we want as much of that discussion to happen before it changes to give people the opportunity and time to actually help inform and drive that change. So we have comment threads going, inputs, videos, examples, so on and so forth, that at the end of the day, the chief financial officer can make that change and then push that out. And then once that's pushed out, we then disseminate it further. It's, that's not gonna be a one size fits all, but I think the one thing that any company would benefit from here is uh, intentional transparency. I don't like to use the term radical transparency because radicalizing anything is probably not a great idea, but being very intentional about transparency, people tend to appreciate it. I mean, it's not gonna make big changes any easier to swallow or any less jarring, but there's a level of appreciation and calm that comes with being open and transparent. Um, okay, great. Um, I'm going to ask um, Omri's question for him. So Omri's question was, would you say that remote work involves much more async work? For example, working on a Google Doc versus discussing during a set meeting? Do you feel async is important and would you recommend to a company that abruptly moved to remote work a few weeks ago to adopt more async processes or continue working asynchronously with many Zoom meetings? This is a great question. I'm answering with a few links here. Um, I think this, the three of these stacked together will give you an idea of how we approach this. So the answer is yes, uh, you should lean into async as much as you possibly can and get there as quickly as you can. That said, that last link there is on the phases of remote adaptation. And essentially what's gonna happen is if you've become suddenly remote, what you probably need to do first is, is just try to stabilize. So if you were gonna have a meeting in an office, just try to have that same meeting virtually. Skeuomorphism, like what you, you basically just make an in-person thing a virtual thing. So in this case, you may want to keep people synced to the time zone at least for the first couple of weeks, because again, minimizing chaos should be goal number one. So if you thrust everyone out of the office and then you also say, everyone work asynchronously, it doesn't matter when you're available online, here's a tool, I hope you can use it. That might work, but it also may introduce chaos. So if you're going to do that, you need to be very intentional about how people do it, what tools are used for what, what the expectations are. That's what we do at GitLab. The expectations are very clear, so async works really, really well. But I do love that you're already thinking about that because in my view, phase three and onward is a very, very, an organization that's steeped in asynchronous where it matters a lot less when you're on and you're focused more on the result of a certain project. And you enable people with tools like GitLab, with tools like Google Docs, to collaborate asynchronously and read it on their own time and move a project forward on their own time, always adhering to a deadline, of course, but instead of having to carve up their day with synchronous meetings, you try to leave longer blocks for uninterrupted, deep, asynchronous work. At scale, this works, um, this works much better. So I would say, give yourself some grace. It's okay if you're synchronous for the first few weeks, but I would say, try to move toward an async environment. Because even if you go back to the office six months from now, having an async focus will help your people work more efficiently and more effectively, even if some of them are in the office and some of them are not. And I think there's one, I know we're at the, we're at the top of the hour. I think there's one last question. Well, the other question was also from Omri actually. I, I think there's, there's a question about what tips do you have for handling yearly, quarterly review talks remotely, especially those that aren't expected, expected to be nice? Yeah, so the way we handle this is uh, nothing should be a surprise for a yearly or quarterly review. So I will link our guide to, to um, one-on-ones. 
and <clears throat> everyone at GitLab goes through one-on-ones the same way. We document how a one-on-one should be done so you know how it's going to be done. And in that, if there's ever a performance issue or you're trending, um, not, you're not going to meet a metric, it's something that can be talked about on a weekly basis. And so the reason for this is it's way easier to course correct or, or reduce the scope if it needs to be reduced on a weekly basis than waiting for an entire quarter to pass or an entire year to pass. And so at a, at a simple level, I would say, talk about this on a weekly basis, allow your people on one-on-ones to say like, this scope feels too much. Like I'm not going to meet this deadline. Therefore I think we should reduce the scope such, such that we still ship something by a deadline, but it's just going to be a reduced scope. Or if someone says, you know, this metric, I don't have the, the people that I need. I don't have the knowledge that I need. I don't have whatever it is that you need. Give them the opportunity to say that on a, a more, regular basis. And so the follow up here was, does that mean that you promote OKRs or something else? That is correct. So I'm going to link here. Uh, all of our KPIs and our OKRs are public. And so again, this goes back to transparency where I can see what the objective and key results are for our engineering team and our finance team, even though I don't work in either of those teams. It's very useful for me because it enables me to look at my marketing objectives and key results and ensure that they're going to be moving that forward as well. So if you enable mass transparency on what everybody is aiming for, it enables people to make sure they're rowing the proverbial boat faster, that everyone is working together towards that common goal as a company. So yeah, we're very prescriptive about KPIs and OKRs, and I'll say that you have to be very intentional about what metrics are, what KPIs are, and what the expected results are in a remote setting. Because you, it's, there's no subjectivity. You can't get to a yearly review and say, well, I, you know, I really enjoyed working with you this year, therefore you get a promotion. You have to judge people on results, not the hours that they spend. And for a lot of managers, this is unusual. They're not used to having to be that prescriptive about what they expect from each of their directs. But in a remote setting, you really have to. Otherwise, they kind of don't know what they're aiming at. And some of these conversations could be a surprise. So now's the time. If you are not being prescriptive enough about what the metrics are, write it down. Uh, we write down a lot of things, and KPIs and OKRs are one of those. Um, OK, Darren, uh, if you have time there are a couple more questions uh that actually omri wrote down as well um and if not you can also answer them later in text whatever you prefer cool i've got time for one more how's that and then the rest I yeah. can. Uh, do yeah let's side. do the next one so the next one is what's your recommendation on team sizes when working remotely larger teams smaller teams this is a great question. I need to, I will dig up the handbook page, but we are very prescriptive at GitLab about how many people we will allow to report directly to someone else. It's a very prescriptive amount based on some research that we've done. And I want to say it's under 10 <clears throat> to have reporting directly to someone else before we would try to add something additional because it just gets unwieldy after that. So I don't think that there's a limit on overall company size. On remote, I think a lot of things actually get easier at scale when you're all remote. Time zones is a great example. As a team of four, if you have six hours between each of those four members, it's going to be really tough to ever get all of that team together for very important synchronous meetings. But at scale, if you have 2,000 people, chances are you're going to hire in enough, a diverse array of time zones such that it's, you'll have people on teams that are close enough that the handover becomes much easier. So I would say scale on a, on a major macro team uh, company size level actually gets easier. Uh, but I do think there's something to be said about smaller teams within the company. Um, 10 to 20 probably works best. Beyond that, you like what we do is we start to make sub teams. So marketing is 135 people. That's a very large team. But we try not to have to coordinate something across 135 people. So instead, we break that down into strategic marketing and field marketing and product marketing and corporate marketing. And then we have individual leads that then can get instructions up to and back from the chief marketing officer. Now we have smaller teams that are agile and can kind of dig in and function in their own way. 
Um, but of course, all of our marketing OKRs are written down. So even those individual teams know what the overall marketing goal is, and then they'll align their own OKRs to try to meet that. It all comes back to the writing things down and being transparent. But I do think there's something to be said about a small enough team that you don't feel like super burdened and overwhelmed. I think it's going to be different per team, but for us, it's usually about 10 to 20 seems like the sweet spot. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to wrap it at that. Um, I want to say thank you again, Darren, for joining us today. Um, it's been really um, helpful and I think we learned a lot. There's a lot of knowledge that you shared here. And I think the first thing we're going to do is start documenting just like, uh, just like you did. We have a long way to go there, but I think uh, we'll definitely start doing that. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in Israel in a few months when all this exactly i would love that no thank you again very much for the platform thanks to everyone who joined i know these are strange times hopefully this was useful um we need each other more than ever to rally around a community and be there for each other i think a lot of positive will come from this i'm actually very optimistic on what this is going to mean i've seen people band together in a way that i've never seen and i do think on the other side of that this we won't forget it and we'll we'll recognize how important it is to have that community especially in a remote space so Thank you all very much. I do hope to, to come over and visit in person uh, very, very soon. But until then, you can find me on Twitter. Let me know if I can be of yeah. assistance. Thank you very much, Darren. It was a wonderful. Awesome. Take care, all. Have a great evening. Thank Bye. you. You too. Bye-bye.